Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. As Agnes Nixon wrote in her book in 1981, Jesse Hubbard and Angie Baxter became the first black teenage story in daytime television. The audience fell in love and faithfully followed their story and the story of their close friends, Greg Nelson and Jenny Gardner, who were their classmates at Pine Valley High School. These two super couples entertained millions of fans during their time in Pine Valley and fans continue to talk about both couples today, almost 40 years later. I'm so excited to have these two gentlemen here with me today. Please welcome to the locker room, Lawrence Lau, Greg, and Darnell Williams, Jesse. Oops. Darnell. Hey. Larry. All right. Thank you. Larry, do you like Lawrence or Larry? My friends call me Larry, so please do. Okay, thanks. Thanks for being here today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. I have to tell you, thanks I, for having us. My pleasure as well. Uh, I have a very uh, close girlfriend, my friend Debbie, who grew up watching all my children, and and the four of you, your your two super couples, were were something she was running home from high school for all the time. So uh, yeah. I I know how important you two are to the daytime community, and um, I just read Agnes's book because somebody uh, sent it to me as a present. And uh, I was hoping to, to see stuff about you and was happy to see that at the end about, you know, being the first black daytime super couple, Darnell. Did mm -hmm. you realize that was happening at that time? Did, did no. it have an impact? Well, it certainly had an impact, um, but we, you know, nobody, nobody can predict the future, you know what I mean? Nobody knew it was gonna snowball the way it did. I can't do that. But we were happy that it did. Well, you should be, you should definitely be. Can, can, you, um, hear us? can you hear us, Larry? Maybe I should go into the other room. He can't hear us. Uh, oh, is he having trouble hearing? Yeah, he's having uh, audio. I couldn't hear Darnell, so I'm gonna take it into the other room, which is really close to the router. Okay, um, if you're having trouble hearing him, you might want to sign in and out again, but let's see how it goes from here. So, um, Darnell, talk about, I'll let you go first. Um, do you remember your screen test for All My Children? Yeah, I do. Um, there, there, were, uh, there were a couple of us that uh, had uh, seen each other on the audition circuit, you know, the, you know, the past same few age years. guys, the same age, uh, the guys who are the same age look the same. Yeah. Yeah. And they've gone on to, you know, nice careers, uh, themselves, but I do remember, uh, the, uh, the audition. I remember feeling like this was my job, you know, really confident, and uh, I didn't forget to have fun, you know, at the audition. Did you and, audition with anybody from All My Children? Did you have Yes, to I did with Lisa Wilkinson, who played uh, Jesse's aunt. Oh, okay. Uh, who was amazing. I mean, uh, just, uh, it, it's, it's, a sh it's almost a shame that when they brought us in, Debbie and Darnell, Jesse and Angie, that um, Frank and uh, Nancy, Jesse's aunts, aunt and uncle, you know, kind of were sidelined, you know. Um, I know it was part of a, a big shift in, in storytelling. Yeah. Well, the focus seemed to go to the four of you. Greg and Jenny. Yeah, and um, not just uh, on all my children, but I think um, I think General Hospital kind of with Luke and Laura, um, you know, cracked open a golden egg, you know, for daytime. And so I think people were trying to follow suit and it brought the soaps into, if you will, a golden era um, that involved a huge youth demographic. Mm -hmm. You know, 
And we just happened to be at the right age at the right time. You know, I mean, seriously, you, you, you really were, you know, it's crazy. Um, and it's crazy the popularity, you know, the, and, yeah. and you were there, you were there first. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then Angie and, and then Jesse Greg. came in and then let's see who came then uh, Kim came in, Jenny. And Larry, when did Larry come in? Because uh, I know Debbie started January of 82. Mm -hmm. that, look, that's pretty, <laughs> you've got the dates down. That's good. Well, I started June of 81. And I know six months after that, Debbie came in. But De uh, Kim and I were, I think, already rocking and rolling. Yeah. And I can't remember if Greg came in at that point or came in before Debbie or. Uh, this, and, was, this was your first big role, correct? Like first major television contract. Yeah, yeah. Up until then, I had been doing, you know, um, mostly theater. Uh, Do you remember part. getting the phone, the phone call that says, "Hey, Darnell, you got the you got the the part"? I do, I do. <laughs> I was on, I was on Forty Second Street. Um, I had, uh, I had auditioned for it like a month ago. I had screen tested for you know, for it a month ago already. My agent called me up to the office and I guess I had sort of let all my children go or put it in the bin mm -hmm. so as not to, you know, stress on it. And so uh, Cynthia Raglan was her name. She was my agent at the time. Um, she gave me some story about something um, and I was about to leave and she was like, oh, by the way, <laughs> you booked all my children. <laughs> I was like, what? You? Well, I didn't use the B word, but I was like, how dare you? I went up to get some good news, and you give me some mediocre uh, lateral move there. And then um, as I'm leaving, she says, oh, by the way, you got the job. I was like, what? That's great. Yeah. Larry, can you hear us, Larry? I can hear you and I can see you. Thank God. Oh. <laughs> technology. <laughs> technology. I know. I, I Thank you, it. darling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. She says you're welcome. <laughs> what year did you start, Larry? We Starting, were talking about uh, uh, 1981. It was the fall. It was, it was, uh, I think it was October. I had my screen test. Um, they said, when I think it's the screen, congratulations, Larry, you got the job. Don't leave town. You start working four days. I decided, oh. I'd flown out from California. And uh, my, I remember my agent saying to me, he said, uh, listen, these people, uh, they want to test you for a, a daytime drama. And I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's a soap opera. I said, a soap opera. Come through. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And he, he said, listen, you can go to New York. You'll, you'll, you're guaranteed 600 bucks a week or something like that. And you'll make enough money to pay your rent and, and take acting classes. He was hinting at something. <laughs> <laughs> Use it to learn. Did, um, did you screen test with Kim or was with somebody else? Um, God, you know, I, I think I did. I can't really remember. I just, I was in such, such a day as I'd flown out on the red eye. And I and they, they the seat I had was right next to the bathroom on the plane, so I didn't get much sleep at all. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, but I met Kim shortly thereafter, I'm sure, and, and she's just such a sweetheart. Yeah, so she was on the show. She was on the show already when you came, right? Yes. Because she was, she, she, you and her were best friends on the show. Yes, that's right. Because I we were talking about the chronology. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of the introduction of the characters, it was Jesse, Jenny. Then it was you. I couldn't remember whether it was you or Debbie next. So apparently it must have been you because I think Debbie came in in January of 82. 82. Yeah. yeah. Darnell, do you remember meeting her for the first time? Did you screen test her? No. Um, wait. Did we screen test? 
Yes, I think we did screen test. I don't remember the screen test. I remember I was a little disappointed. I didn't know Debbie at the time. I knew Casey and I wanted Casey to get the role. You know, Casey was a really good friend of mine, um, uh, Casey Lemons. And uh, I had, uh, you know, asked the producers if they would see her. And they did. But then Debbie, you know, she had some she had she had already had a following. She'd been a star already, Roots and all that kind of stuff in the 70s. And so as soon as she expressed an interest in uh, doing the show, uh, they uh, they said, OK, the job is yours. And Casey, who was, um, you know, pretty much an unknown at the point. Uh, at that time, um, you know, they went with uh, Debbie. Mm. Yeah. Who, who or what for both of you was the, uh, the biggest influence on you becoming actors? Oh. I, I think just, you know, sitting at home watching TV and uh, with the family. And, and, you know, seeing kids on TV, I was like, wow, that guy is my age. I can do that. Really? And you, and you, Larry? For me, it was it was a man, a graduate student named Sam Simone. I was a business major at, at BYU, believe it or not, and I was in my last year of, of uh, college. And uh, I was I took a course in, in film appreciation on Saturdays to fulfill a kind of lecture. And uh, and. Uh, <laughs> I was in this auditorium where we just watched a couple of John Ford films, and I walked up to the projector and asked the student a couple of questions. And he turned around, the short little guy, turned around, looked, looked, looked up at me and said, are you an actor? I said, no, no, I'm a business major. And he goes, you should be an actor. I said, no, 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 no. I, I took a speech course once, and my, my, my niece... Uh, I shook so badly behind the, behind the podium that I, that I would never ever do that again. I can't forget about it. I'm doing a play on campus and I want you in it. I said, I gotta go. See you later. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I literally followed me out of the auditorium. He would not let me say no to this audition. I finally said, okay, okay. If you just leave me alone, I'll come and audition. You know, and and I went and auditioned. He gave me the part, of course. And I did this, this one act play, a, a new play on campus. And uh, as soon as the, the the curtain came down and the applause came up, I went, "I got to do this. I have got to do this. This is this is that was my I got bit so 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 sharply." And and I dropped out of I dropped out of the business school that day, and I transferred wow. to the theater, the theater arts department and stayed there for like four or five months doing one act plays. And I, and I said to myself, you know, this I, I, I got to go to L.A. where the professional acting teachers are. And that's what I did. Hmm. And it was your, is it, am I correct, is your first uh, TV thing Eight is Enough? Um, actually, my very first TV thing was a, 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 a show called Paris. It starred James Earl Jones. Uh, it only lasted 13 episodes, but I got the last, I booked the last episode as a, a guest star. A really nice role. It was my first TV job. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I swear to God. 1979. And I, I, the only autograph I've ever asked for in my entire life was James Earl Jones. I remember I walked up to his trailer and I knocked on the door very timidly. You know, and I'm, I'm working, I'm working this episode with him. And I'm, <laughs> It's Mr. Jones, and I and uh, I knock on the door. And he opens the door. And he looks down at me. And he says, "Yes." <laughs> I can't even get close to his baritone. And I said, "Would you sign my 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 play?" He had done uh, the Paul Robeson one the one man show called Paul based on the life of Paul Robeson. And, uh, and he said, "Well, sure, I'll be glad to do it for you." And uh, anyway, that's that was my very first TV job in 1979. Not, not a bad, uh, you know, uh, co-star to, you know, to be in a James Earl Jones show. Oh my God, I was just, I was absolutely speechless around him. So, yeah, yeah, he was magic. I remember when he was doing a, um, he was doing a Robeson on Broadway. I went to see him. I went backstage, and um, I was like, Mister, Mister, uh, Mister. 
<laughs> Mr. Jones, I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> he's like, hold on, wait, let me get rid of everybody. And I, he invited me to walk him to his hotel, which was around uh, up on 48th Street and 10th Avenue or something like that. So I walked with him to his hotel. Just, I don't even remember what we spoke about. I was like, ah, this is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so gracious, man. You know, I'm, I'm sure I was just being the young actor, you know, just trying to suck all the knowledge out of his head. Mm -hmm. Really? Gosh. Very true. Oh, that when you went to answer your question, my, my next job was an episode on, I did an episode on Happy Days, and then I did a pilot, and then I did uh, Eight is Enough, and then I did a Waltons, all in the course of like four months in 1980. You, you did a lot of great early, you know, 80s television. The Love Boat. Love Boat, do you yeah. Have, do you have a favorite? Um, well, sentimentally, I think the Waltons is, is kind of like. Wow. Uh, I think it's kind of like, for some reason, it really just sticks out. But Happy Days was so much fun. Henry Winkler was such a prince to me. I was, I, I, it was my second job. I still didn't know my, my, my elbow from my, you know, whatever. And, uh. Uh, and I, I didn't know what, what I was doing as an actor. I really didn't. I was supposed to walk into the, 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 the soda shop and, and be the, this, this big man on campus and go pick up Jenny Piccolo to, to go to the... Uh, Jenny Piccolo! <laughs> and I was supposed to like and not, you know, to say, do you, <laughs> you want to go to the, the, the costume ball with me? And, and so uh, I was supposed to walk into this, this soda shop as the big man on campus. I walked in hunched over like you know feeling very very shy and very very non you know and, there. and uh henry winkler after that and uh hey buddy he put his arm around me walking around the corner and he said you're gonna do great you're gonna do just you're gonna do really really good just just open up your arms and open up your open up your lift your lift your chin up and you know, he gave me these you know, advice I'm like a man a big man and he, and, he, and he get through my, my second experience. You know. That's pretty good. Yeah, I've loved him ever since. He just did a series called um, Barry. 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 I love Barry. That's crazy. Love Barry. <laughs> so good. And Henry, he's just brilliant. I mean, he's had just, I mean, his career. Hey, Michael, can you come get Haley? Haley. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to believe he's still that prince of a guy. He's, yeah. he, he still seems to be that kind of gentleman. Um, and, and that role on Barry is something else, isn't it? His role? <laughs> <laughs> he's great. And, you know, Arrested Development, he was brilliant. Yeah. 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 Love that guy. I, some of the fans were asking what the sound was. That's Darnell's dog. <laughs> It was Haley, Haley, it's Haley. Uh, making some she, making some noise. When you both arrived in Pine Valley, was there somebody there who took you under your wing, sort of showed you, you know, like Henry helped you a little, you know, doing Happy Days. Was there somebody in Pine Valley who helped you guys? Uh, well, you know, um, it, it was, it was, I felt it was immediately a family. I, I can't right away think of one person we did um have to share dressing rooms you know larry and i we were roommate dressing roommates and um mark lemura so you know we, huh for over four years yes in a little cubicle and so you know we were each other's go-to, you know, wingman kind of look out for each other kind of thing, you know, and it, it, it kind of worked that way. Your roommates were your, you know, they kind of showed you the ropes, mm -hmm. you know, and if the associate producer, you know, didn't take you by the arm to show you around, you know? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I, also, Ruth Work was very kind to me in, in the beginning. They were all, they were all so, I mean, like I said, it was just joining a family, a big family. Um, Louis Edmonds, man, uh, on my audition, he just came out before anybody knew who the job was going to be awarded to. He was like, 
this is your job, man. This is uh, you, you. This is your job. <laughs> and I knew that he. I knew that he was uh, Phoebe Wallingford's husband. I was like, wow, you. Thank you. He just. He just puffed me up. I was like, oh my god, I left there on a cloud. Were you? Were you a soap watcher, Darnell? No, I was. No. My I, mom I, I know Larry was, and he didn't know what, what the daytime drama was. I knew, I knew what it was because my mom used to watch it, and um, um, I had a couple of friends that were really into it. Jackie, you remember Jackie, Larry? Oh yeah, she was, she was a huge soap opera fan. Um, all my children fan, I should say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you, since I mentioned her in my intro, I mean, I was really sort of blown away reading Agnes's book and 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 the um, just the creativity that generated from one woman to create land view, you know, one life to live and then Pine Valley and to to think about it in 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 such broad strokes that she did. I mean creating, you know, two suit not at the same time it was basically she created two super powers. Yeah. You know, with the four of you. Yeah. And you know, what I think is even what I think is even more amazing is the time that she did it. You know, I mean, she was a woman in the old boys club. Yeah, totally. And, um, she said, he, uh, "Not today, fellas." <laughs> Coming through. Also, there was, there, was, there was a newness to the fact that Darnell's character was 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 a black kid from the wrong side of the tracks. That, that was yeah. Before, before then, they had to be a doctor or a lawyer or somebody middle class and successful, you know, out of out of fear of uh, being considered racism, you know. But, yeah, stereotypical. Yeah. But, 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 but she paved the way for for a black couple. I mean, there wasn't any other black couple on daytime television really as successful yeah. at that time. Well, I think they, you know, uh, they had the intent, you know, and. Um, Agnes was always she was always trying to stay ahead of the curve, which she managed to do quite successfully, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so they they were hoping, you know, that this character took off. And when it when it did, it 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 exceeded their wildest dreams, you know, most of ours, you know. Well, speaking to that, did first of all. Uh, before I get that question, did you get to know Agnes, both of you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was she like in person? Sweetest. She, uh, she, I don't know. She was sugar and spice and all things nice, man. And on top of that, brilliant. Yeah. You know, um, and she was like, she was like a great ma mother figure, mm -hmm. you know, even when she was younger. And we were around there when we first came around, you know, she was hmm. just, I don't know, just that. Did, and you earlier, when we were backstage, Darnell, did you say your dad was in the Air Force? Mm -hmm. Because she, Agnes, had lost her first boy, boyfriend. Right, uh, right. I do remember reading that in her book. In the Air Force, Forget yeah. about that. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Really fascinating. Um, so for both of you, you know, like you said, you know, they were aiming to make these couples popular. When did it or how did it hit you that you realized how uh, beloved you were to the fans? Oof. Oh, boy, there's so, so many little things. Um, when we, we have both appeared in, in, in uh, Life magazine, uh, photographs taken by this amazing <laughs> photographer named Atkinson, I think his name was. Yeah. The, yeah. Photographers in the country at the time. And they were paying a tribute to um, Harrell. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. that was like I said, I've been on the show four months. I'm in Life magazine. Wow. How can this be happening? <laughs> you know, and, and then, of course, then people chasing me down the street, you know, in the restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, it was, it was flattering. It was flattering in the beginning, you know, because you, you know, you, you achieved something, and or at least in my mind. <clears throat> but then it became an entity unto itself, 
you know, um, something that you had, you, you really had to sit back and think about how to embrace it. <laughs> you know, because a lot of times um, you really had to pull yourself in from saying what you really wanted to say to somebody that's not necessarily reacting properly. Yeah, right. You know? You sometimes they can overstep oh, if they've overstepped. Um, it's a huge, huge learning curve. <laughs> yeah. I, I am sure. Darnell, I was watching an interview of you and Debbie, and Debbie was t relaying a story of the two of you going to the movies. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I always get it wrong. Um, I always get it wrong, but she can tell it better. But this is when we first realized that these characters had taken off this way because we had gone to see a movie in Times Square of all places. This is when all those movies were really rowdy in Times Square. I don't know why we ended up there, but the lights came up and then we heard the whisperings. Oh my God, that's Jesse and Angie. And then it just sort of reverberated throughout the whole <laughs> auditorium. And we were like, oh my God. I mean, we were, you know, walking out, you know, among the throngs. <laughs> and I think it was me that grabbed Debbie's hand or she, one of us. I was like, run, Debbie, run. <laughs> and we we started running up um, 7th Avenue Broadway, up Broadway with this throng of fans chasing us. And we're like, oh my God, what's going on? I don't, I don't even know what happened after how we got out of that. It's so interesting, though, you know, the early 80s. I mean, soaps were like you, you were saying earlier, Luke and Laura just kicked it into gear for all of daytime. Yeah. Yeah. And Judith Light, she had a lot to do with that. And Ant, what, what was his name? Anthony, the guy that took his life back in the day. But Judith Light was on One Light to Live. And she. Like, yeah. yeah. And this is when they start. Uh, this is when I guess the trend started shifting to the youth storyline, you know? Yeah. And then, then there was Luke and Laura. Then there was Jesse and Jenny. Then Jesse and Angie. And then Jenny and Greg, or Jenny, and, yeah. You know, and then they were all to the races. What do you remember with the four of you working? as closely as you all did during that time. Oh, it, it's it's so nostalgic now, you know? I mean, um, I can I can wrap it all up with three letters, F-U-N, you know? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, there was such great camaraderie between the four of us. It was instant and, and genuine and authentic and, and immediate. And we all lived in the same, we, we lived within a block of each other for, for a minute there, just wow. about. When we all lived out in the village, right? that was great. One of the fun things that I remember coming to work is that Darnell and I would always fight for the cot. And we had these- <laughs> <laughs> To take a nap? We had this small, we had this small little dressing room and Darnell and I, you know, shared there was one little cot in there, you know, and, and you know, sometimes our call times would be like 7 a.m. And and you wouldn't you'd have to wait until like seven thirty to get actually called into the into the rehearsal room, and I remember getting trying to get the, to the dressing room before Darnell and I caught him there, you know, ahead of me going, God dang it, Darnell, you always beat me. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I was driving in from Brooklyn. You uh, know? Yeah. 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 That's so funny, Darnell. Somebody said Gerald Anthony. Is that who, I think who you were referencing? Gerald Anthony. That's who you're referencing. Yeah, I think they, you know, I mean, in my, in my purview, looking back, um, they, uh, they started it, they sparked it, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, then there was Luke and Laura and then Jesse and Angie, Greg and Jenny, and the, uh, you know, all the other subsequent soaps that followed, followed suit. Yeah, they all did in the 80s. You're not kidding. Cliff and Nina. Nina. Cliff and Nina. Cliff oh, and my God. God. Yeah. Guiding Light had the Four Musketeers. As the World Turns had Lillian Holden. It is all in the sort of 80 time yeah. frame. Oh, yeah. yeah. That they, they all had that. 
Uh, it was a golden era. I wonder if they, they'll look back like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and think that this is the golden era of soap operas. This age? I mean, it would be hard with just four. I mean, at the time you're talking, there were probably 10 or, you know. There were, no, there were 13, 18. I think there were 18. 18. In, in the 80s, wow. Yeah, there were a lot. Crazy. I know that when I first started on All My Children in 80, 81, there were, there were nine thriving soap operas in New York City, and there were four out in L.A., and it, it, gave, it provided a lot of work for a lot of daytime actors. Absolutely. And it, it provided a lot of work for actors in New York, period. Yeah. Right. I mean, we would talk about, we would talk to actors that, you know, are in New York um, studying and, uh, you know, um, coming through all my children's gates, Pine Valley's gates, just, you know, on their way to whatever their career is going to be, you know? But not only actors, I mean, it, directors, you know, hair or makeup, you know, writers, all of that. It's really a shame that there isn't, there, there's just not that experience. I mean, think of what you learn, especially as an actor, for sure, working on a daytime soap in New York City. It's, oh, yeah. it, it's school, it's like a school you'll never get. There's no other learn. There's no better, no better um, schooling for an actor, really. You know, I mean... I mean, you get to, if, you, if you can do daytime, you can just about do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you're so comfortable with the camera. The camera actually almost disappears. You know, you don't, you, you, it's not even there, really, a part of your consciousness after a while. It's, it's, it's just, it's just great. Yeah. So who learned their lines easier? Uh, I have to say, I, I, it was really easy for me in the beginning. I don't know why, but I, I found learning lines not... Not that difficult, except for this one. Well, uh, it was for me. It was just a continuation of how I used to do my stuff in theater. You know, so uh, I mean, a little more intense because <laughs> you know you'd have different lines every day. You know, I remember but, on, on another world where I I looked at my script the night before, and I said to myself, "Oh, this is great! I only have a half a page of dialogue tomorrow." This is this is going to be a piece of cake. So I put the script down and went out and had a couple of beers with some friends and stuff, and <laughs> so, you know got up you know early and you know on a, not enough sleep, but it was only a page and a half of dialogue. What's the big deal? I would go into the rehearsal hall and they said, Larry, that's the wrong script. No. I said, what? <laughs> I said what? And, they, and 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 they go, this is this is today's script. You got tomorrow's script. I said, well, let me look at today's script. And there were 40 pages of dialogue for my character. Oh, my God. I had an hour and a half to get it down. I, I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. You know, I was, I, was on, I, was a, I was on a witness stand being, being interrogated by a prosecuting attorney. And uh, it was like intense dialogue. And I don't know how I pulled it off. Those are the worst. Those are the, the worst sweat, things. The sweat would have like. Especially um, under that circumstance. Puddles. I was definitely in puddles that day. That is crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's definitely, you know, throws you to the fire. Um, one of our fans, GT Lem, Larry, was asking what it was like working uh, with Natalie Ross, who played the ultimate mother from hell. God, Natalie, I love her. I just, Natalie Ross is the best in the whole world. I just love her to death. And I wish we could, we could keep, we could have kept going for, you know, longer. Um, just a, a nicer, sweeter, more talented person I can't imagine ever working with. I, I love that. His description, mother from hell, and then she ends up being the nicest person. She was, <laughs> she was great. She was, she was amazing. Oh, Enid. Enid, uh, yeah. Enid. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, she was great. And, and the two of you uh, worked closely with uh, Michael E. Knight. Can you share memories of working with Michael? Michael, we didn't, you know, I mean, it was, you know, in terms of hanging out, me, um, Debbie, Larry, and Kim, and then Steve and Caffrey, remember? I mean, it seemed more so. Every once in a while, Mike would join the group, but Michael was a little more um, to himself. Yeah. You know? He was, he was a very nice guy, a very nice gentleman. Yeah, no, I mean, he was, he was, there was nothing, 
Uh, yeah, you're right. But um, yeah, I mean, it was. And it he was, came in after you guys, so it's also hard to come into, you know, when the four of you are so tight. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, um, but um, he seen, I think he, I think I um, was speaking, we did a Zoom thing. Was that you, Alan? No, anyway, he was talking about how, how welcomed he felt when he did come to the show. You know, I forgot exactly what he said verbatim, but um, I don't think there was much intimidation there. I think he just felt. I mean, I think Darnell, you pegged it so correctly in the sense that the, almost the entire studio was friendly and loving and welcoming. I mean, it really was like a family. It really was. I mean, people think, ah, I couldn't be that great. There's always got to be one. But really, yeah. I mean, it's just all these people working so hard toward one goal. Unlike which, some soaps that I heard about. Yeah, we used to hear that, and we, we, we would hear from other people from other houses. Um, <clears throat> I was like, wow. After the, you know, after the day had been done, I was like, wow, it, it's just, it's amazing um, the, the feeling you get coming into this studio, um, the way you all get along with each other. The, I mean, more than three or four times when we had guest stars from, you know, other soaps. I would hear this, you know, I was like, wow, yeah, it's, it's good to hear. That, that's the way it is around here, folks. Yeah. Well, then that's why you I easily return to I wonder if this, if it had anything to do with the fact that in those days, they used to serve real meals in the restaurant scenes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean in the restaurant scenes, they had real steak, real mashed potatoes, hot, heated, heat, <laughs> vegetables. And, and I remember one time this girl made that, she served real wine. And this girl, I remember she had to do several takes and she got a little slosh. <laughs> how did they, how did that happen? I mean, wow. That's so funny. <laughs> Food always wins, you gotta admit that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was Dorothy Lyman like who played Opal? Oh, wow. She was a hoot, she was great. She, she brought just a bag full of sunshine when she came to the show. You know, everybody loved her. She was great. So talented. Yeah. Yeah. She was wonderful. What, 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 what are some of your, there. Larry, what are some of your favorite storylines for while you were there? Oh, on all my children. Oh, gosh. I think the my favorites, I think the scene that sticks out for me the most is when Jenny was just about to say, I do to Tony. And Greg finally gets freed from the, I think he was locked up or tied up or something like that. And so he finally gets, finally gets freed up and he runs to the church. And just like in, um, oh, what's the, what's the name of that movie with, with um, what's his face? He pounds on the doors, you know? And the doors let me stop. in. Pardon me? Let me in. Let me in, let me, let me in, let me in. And the doors fling open and he goes, Jenny! <laughs> <laughs> And he grabs her and he has to punch his way out, you know, and, and he grabs her and they, they go into the back room and he explains everything to her. And, and it's, it's, it's the, you know, it was the, the, the ending of a, or the end of a long storyline. It was really special. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a film I'm trying to think of that, that kind of like they made, they might have mirrored, mirrored the storyline on a little bit. Um, well, he did that a lot. Agnes always pulled from topical headlines, you know, all of her stories, you know, they started becoming much more topical um, during the mid 80s, I think, you yeah. know, Social with the AIDS, with that, with the, with the AIDS outbreak and all that kind of stuff. She's, you know, she put, you know, well, first of all, she did the black storyline, boom, then she did the AIDS storyline, then she did the... Um, same sex marriage storyline yeah. or whatever, something like that. Yeah. Well, Erica's daughter, yeah, Erica's daughter being a lesbian. Yeah. What do you, are there favorite stories of, for you, Darnell? That's really hard. Um, <clears throat> I always like going out on location, you know. So, I mean, favorite stories, it's really hard. You've got, I don't know, yeah, like, 18,000 scripts. <laughs> yeah, you Talk about the locations you got to do. 
Um, early, you know, we got to uh, Jenny and um, Jesse were in uh, New York City. We shot right there where I'm living now, right there on Ninth Avenue and uh, 43rd Street, 45th. And right? really? Yeah, I mean, I have a place in Manhattan Plaza. I know, I used to live on that block, I swear to God. Yeah, we yeah we shot there. That's where Jen, when Jenny was in New York and Jesse went to look for her, oh. and um, we had all these uh, uh, fire escape scenes. It was cool. Yeah. You know, Are nice you thinking of the Graduate? Thank you. Finally, I'm. I'm the Graduate. I'm, I'm, that's what I. Oh, thought, but I <laughs> that's, that's the I'm thinking definitely the Graduate. Yeah. Elaine. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I you know, of, I, I lived around the corner from where you lived. I was at 37th and 10th. Oh, wow. Yeah. I had a friend that lived on 36th and 10th. Yeah, it changed enormously. I don't, yeah, such a great area now. Um, yeah. Uh, now it's like zombie land oh, you know, wow. yeah. with the pandemic oh, it's and, really, uh, it's and de Blasio's great plan. You know. <laughs> yeah. What What can you share, uh, possibly, about Debbie or Kim that fans would be surprised to know? Oh my God, that that could be trouble. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, um, I don't know what they wouldn't part know. Of, part of it might be for me when it comes to Kim. The fact that she was so genuinely her self. She was just the, the sweetest, nicest, most positive, you know, actress you could possibly have the pleasure to work with. She was just she really and she really was that person. As sweet as could be. Yeah. It makes it easy. Debbie was the same, you know. I mean um yeah, I think I'd have to agree with you, Larry. I mean someone would probably be surprised at how sweet they are. Yeah. You know, both of them. Yeah. You know? Makes it easy to come to work. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, again, that, you know, that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, the whole, the whole environment, the entire environment was just, um, you know, yeah. warm. I, I don't remember a time when I didn't, want to get up and go to work you yeah. know it was that always was great lot. yeah that says a lot larry we were talking earlier can you just talk about the experience on as the world turns yes that was so brave of chris galvin to, to run this storyline it was a, a supposed to be a three-month storyline uh brian wheatley uh was a man very confused about his own sexuality uh, or very ashamed of 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 his preferences, uh, and I did, did not know how to deal with it. He was a you know man of middle age or a little bit more than middle age, and uh, he was ashamed and, and afraid that it was he was going to be outed, and so he married an, just a slightly elderly woman to cover to cover for that. And um, the one thing that I did differently that may have been the part of the reason why the storyline was extended was that I said to myself. To make this really work, I've got to really fall for Lucinda, the uh, the woman that Elizabeth is, Hubbard. Yeah, I, yeah. I, and I and I said, uh, I, I mean, I've really got to make it as real as possible that I'm not just you know, the guy with with the mustache twirling his thing, going, "Yeah, I'm going to use you for a beer," <laughs> but but really, really find a way, you know, to 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 love her in a certain way, and and really respect her and and. and Admire her, etc. And I, the more I played that, the, the harder it became to justify my attraction to her grandson. If you, if you can follow that logic, and um, and anyway, so it was, it was great. And I just I loved working with her because she took the work very seriously. We would like meet up in her dressing room every every day that we worked together. We meet we'd meet up in her dressing room before we had to go on set and we would work the lines. We would work them over and over and over again. And, and, and she was a great fixer. <laughs> no, that's a great way. She's a spitfire. I mean, she yeah. is. You gotta be on your toes with Elizabeth Hubbard. 
Boy. I remember I was my favorite scene between her and me was when I invited her to go on a mushroom hunt. And she said, a what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, a mushroom hunt. You'll love it. <laughs> we'll go camping. She said, camping? <laughs> you want to take me camping? <laughs> she was great. Yeah, that is so funny. And Darnell, uh, you spent some time working over at Guiding Light. Yeah, yeah, I did. Like playing a villain. Yeah, oh, I, I, I lose Rick. track of the characters. Jack something. He shot somebody in the neck. I Griggs, right? Griggs. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you worked with I Rob Bow. I actually, I worked over there for about six months. Um, then I started directing over there a little bit, you know, segments. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Wait, Ellen Wheeler? Mm-hmm. She, because we, she was uh, with all my children early mid eighties. You know, she's the one that did the AIDS storyline. Remember that, Larry? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she gave me some segments over there. You know, as I was learning the uh, ever so difficult uh, what task. Was it like? What was directing? it like? From an actor to to directing. Horrible. I shouldn't say hard. It's just extremely hard, you know. I mean, it takes a while. I, I asked, um, I asked Casey Lemon. So, how long does it take before you feel like you're doing, you know, like you're up and running with this? And he was like, "Well, it takes about four years before the knot in your stomach is gone." Wow. So I had about three years to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, but it was a uh, it was a great experience, a great learning uh, curve for me. You know. Do you still want to do more directing? Yeah, not necessarily daytime. That's I mean that's even harder than being an actor. I remember being a director in daytime, saying, "Whoa!" I was being I was um, looking at actors just walking by, just breezing. I was like, "Oh, you lucky." <laughs> you don't know how easy you have it. <laughs> well, well, especially later as soaps were having to tape more in a day. It wasn't just one show. Oh, no, that's when I came in and when they started doing the segments, you know, breaking the shows up, you know, doing doing shows, um, grabbing segments from shows uh, two weeks down the line, doing them today, you know, and... Yeah, it's crazy. It was the continuity just went was all shot to hell. You know, yeah, that makes it tough. Uh, the fans will kill me if I don't ask for both of you. Uh, Liza, Marcy Walker was such a big part of uh, those early days. What can you share about working with Marcy? Just that she was uh, incredibly talented and, and uh, again very uh, very sweet, and very kind, and and, and she's just so talented. She, she, had, she had a rough, rough, uh, she had a rough time in the beginning because um, she, her character was so evil, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, a lot of the fans mistreated her because of that. You know, that yeah. Was, some of these fans couldn't separate the fact that she's she's actually performing her her, her job as an actor, you know, and, and and thinking that she really was this this awful person. Well, that's what, you know, so funny, you both talking about, you know, the, the fans at that time and, you know, they loved the four of you, but there are some, you know, soap actors back in the 80s who used to get like punched on the street for things. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> well, you know, and again, to 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 uh, Marcy's credit, I mean, it was it was such a joy to work with her. I mean, she just I mean, well, we get that. I, I guess we got that from a lot of people because I certainly got it from Debbie and from um from kim even though she was she was a novice but um being just the young actors we were it just worked you know but um um i just remember being elevated with um scenes in scenes with marcy um and debbie you know um they just take you to a place where you you're not acting you're just responding yeah. you know reacting I agree. And that's um, that makes it so I was like, wow, I didn't know I had that in me. 
<laughs> you know. Yeah. Darnell, do you um, remember your Emmy wins? Yes, I do. What yeah. stands out? Well, what stands out was my dad was there for the f no, my mom was there for the first one, and my dad was there for the second one. So nice. that's what stood out. Well, th that's an awesome way to one for each. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Each. Uh, Lawrence, one of, Larry, one of our fans, Eric, said, this is to Greg. Jenny is not dead. She's at General Hospital. Go to her, man. You're welcome. <laughs> wow. Thanks for that. We just wouldn't have known. <laughs> well, I'll go hunt her down. It's so funny that the minute they see, you know, one of you somewhere else, or they totally would love the pairings again. I know. Yeah. Wouldn't that be something? That would be fun. It would be fun. What What do you remember when uh, Kim decided to leave that first time and that uh, the uh, jet ski? Where did you film that jet ski? Out in New Jersey, there was a, some some state park out there that had all the requirements and the lake and all that stuff. And oh wow. wow. I'm out in Jersey. I wonder where. It was, I think, about an hour, hour and a half drive from the studio here in New York, if that makes mm -hmm. any idea. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was really fun. I remember uh, when the when the jet ski actually you know blew up, um, and Michael Knight and I had to swim out to to rescue Jenny, hoping hoping she was still alive. And I'm a really good swimmer, right? But Michael Knight beat me. <laughs> How can this happen? <laughs> um, but, but I don't know what to say, say about it, except for the fact that it was, um, it, I was sad that Kim was leaving the show. Yeah. Yeah, we all were. Yeah. You know, it, was such it a, broke up the foursome. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, God, God bless her. She went out and she, uh, you took a very courageous, courageous step to, to break into the prime time, and she did so finally. And God bless her; she's just a she's a force and a talent. Man. Do you miss all my children? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I do. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was a fantastic experience. A fantastic experience. And you got to come back uh, when Darnell and well, and Jesse and Angie got remarried at the end, right? Yes, and I also yeah, near got the end. near the end. I also got to visit Jenny's grave, which was a very touching and moving scene. I was so so impressed that they wrote that scene and they let Greg talk to Jenny at, at, to her headstone. You know, it was um very very moving. I thought for a minute Darnell was uh, stuck there. It's so funny. I thought he was. He looked frozen for a minute. <laughs> well, now I only see you, Alan. Yeah, me too. I, I think he. he his internet might have uh, kicked him off for a minute. Um, the dog. Talk about theater. Talk about theater. I know you love theater. Um, you've done a lot of theater recently. Do you have a favorite role you've done? Yeah, I have, I have a couple. Uh, the first, the, my first role, when I tra made the transition in 2003, uh, I had uh, was leaving One Life to Live after two years, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And uh, four days before my last taping, uh, no, no, uh, four days after my last taping, I was on a plane flying to Vienna. Oh, Austria. That Darnell's calling. <laughs> hey, Darnell. Hey, my battery died. Oh, okay. Are you going to try to sign on before? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying now. I'm coming back up. Okay. Thanks. In my table, this this thing is pretty slow. All right. We'll, we'll see you in a minute. His battery died. <laughs> oh, no. So can continue. Sorry about that. So anyway, I was I was on one life to live at the time, and my contract was was expiring, and and they were not renewing because they they brought in the old writers from you know a decade or so before that, and they didn't know who my character was, Sam Sam Yappaport, and uh, and that was that and that was fine. And then my, I remember on the, a few days before my last show, my agent called up and said, "Listen, Larry, there's a." There's a an audition for a play called The Goat, uh, Edward Albee's um, Tony Award-winning play, and um, they're they're doing it in Vienna. And I said, Vienna? You mean Ohio? 
And she said, no, this is Vienna, Austria. And I said, you got to be kidding me. She said, no. Um, They're like, I'm there. Yeah, I, and I said, well, yeah, are you kidding? I'd love to try. So um, a couple of days later, it was the day of the audition, and there was a huge snowstorm in New York at the time. And, and I looked out. I got to One Life to Live. I was working that day. And, but I had a three-hour break at lunchtime so I could do this audition. My agent calls up and says, listen, Larry, there's a foot and a half of snow out there. Everybody's canceling. You don't have to go to this audition if you don't want to. He said, just, you know, forget about it if you don't want to go. But I thought to myself, what the heck? You know, why not? I just give, I give a, a, I'll have my first theater audition. Because I, I, I grew up in television. I didn't grow up in theater. So this is my, this, this would have been and did turn out to be my, my first serious theater role. And so I went down and, and it was Pam McKinnon who was directing this, this, uh, this production of The, the Goat. Uh, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's, she went on to be an amazing uh, Broadway director. She's now- Her name sounds familiar. Now head of um, a famous acting school out in San Francisco. Um, but anyway, so I go down and I audition, I, I trudge through the snow and I, I get down to this, um, this audition space in Midtown. And I, I meet this very cordial, very quiet spoken woman named Pam McKinnon. And there's this chair in the middle of the room. And, and the scene they've got me doing is, is this very touching, quiet, um, heartfelt, sentimental scene, you know, where he's trying to explain to his wife, you know, why he's in love with somebody else, you know, or something like that. And, and this chair was in the middle of the room and the reader for the scene was like way over there. So I, I, I remember I pulled the chair really close to the reader, and I had a conversation with her. So it was so I could talk to her like a person, instead of having to belch out loud volume from the middle of the room. And I left and she said, thank you very much for coming. I got, an, I got a call from my agent the next day, and she says, or, or that night, she goes, Pam really liked you, Larry, but she wanted to know if you'd be willing to come back in tomorrow and just make reassure her that you can talk loud enough to be a theater actor. And I said, sure, I can do that. So I got down there the next day. The chair, went, once again, was in the middle of the room. And I, and this time, instead of pulling the chair closer to the reader, I pulled it as far as it would go the other direction. And I did the scene, making sure that the reader could hear me. That's all That's all that was required. And I got the job. And four days, four days after my last shooting on One Life to Live, I was in the air flying to Austria. Wow. Yeah do an eight-week gig on uh, in, the, in this beautiful, amazing theater called the, the English-Speaking Theater of Vienna um, that had been around since the early 1960s. And it was a gorgeous theater, 300 seat, right in the heart of downtown Vienna. And I was in heaven. Yeah, I can imagine. Once I got the lines down and, and the play was on its feet, it was just such a gift. There's so much art, so much music, so much architecture, um, so much history. Oh my God, it was um, it was such a gift. And that's nice to go from one thing to something as special as that too, to go from one life. Yeah, I, I thought somebody I must have done something right at some point in my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't mind like leaving a job and having to go to Europe. Uh, that that's pretty good. What was it like working with Ms. Hickland over at One Life? Oh, she was always a gas. She was. Uh, she's just. She's just. Uh, Sparkly, perky, uh, driven, uh, sarcastic. Uh, uh, she, she's a she's, she's a, a hoot, hoot. right? She what? She's a hoot. She's a hoot. Yeah, she <laughs> really. That's the, That's the word. Yeah, <laughs> she's a real sweetheart too. Yeah. Um, during this pandemic, have you learned anything about yourself that you didn't know? Oh God, what a good question, Alan. Um, yes, uh, I would have to say I have learned to have confidence and and to relax a bit about the amount of fear that could be generated if if you if you allow yourself to 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 fester and foment. Uh, anxiety and fear. It's just I've learned to take it a day at a time, and and to try to be grateful for every day that, that happens. I know that may sound cliche, but I don't know any other way to deal with this this um, 
this stressful yeah. place. It's it's true though. I mean, you shouldn't apologize for how you know everybody has to deal with it in their own way and whatever that is. You make you make it work. Are you a uh, TV person? Do you watch things? Um, you- not really. My girlfriend and I we like to watch Judge Judy to relax. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's just it's good for some chuckles, you know, and and whatnot. And it's not every night, but it's it's couple times a week. Uh, I do find myself watching a lot of series on uh, Netflix, etc. We, you know, we just watched this this latest series um, called The Bow. This oh my God, we just finished it last night. Is that not creepy? Oh my God. It, it's insane. It's yeah. insane. So you watched the first, know, first season. Yeah, we just finished it. Yeah, all nine episodes. Yep. And I didn't realize that they um, were doing a second season until the end of last night's. Yeah, yeah, I didn't either. So I'm so yeah. looking forward to it. I mean, this this guy sh- so deserves his his um, just desserts. Right? I mean it. Yeah, I mean it really. For anybody who doesn't know, it's about that cult nexium um, that involved Allison. Um, I can't think of her. Uh, Allison Mack. Allison Mack and um, Catherine Oxenberg's daughter. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bonnie. Was it Bonnie? No. Hey. No. Sorry, Darnell's FaceTiming at the same time. <laughs> Is it not working, Darnell? Oh, I'll text it to you right now. Hold on. He's. Or Darnell's trying to get back on. Yeah, I just found it fascinating. Um, yeah, so did I. Larry, it was really something. So insinuatingly evil. I mean, yeah. The fact, the fact that intelligent, competent, you know, One aware, sec. human beings could fall for this. Here he is. Ridiculous threat. Right, I didn't hear <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Th- thanks for coming. We we were just talking about uh, the vow. I don't know if you heard about the HBO documentary. No. It, it's sort of about uh, this sex traffic and cult. It was pretty amazing. I was asking if uh, you had any TV guilty pleasures during this time. During, during what time? During this pandemic, have you been watching anything? Oh, I just finished wa- <laughs> watching Shit's Creek. Uh-huh. Ah. Love it. It's yeah. just amazing. I mean, just brilliantly done in the way they went out, you know, at the top of their game. Larry, I talk about, you know, we were sort of talking about stress. Shit's Creek is what you need from start to finish. It just will put a smile on your face every okay. single time you watch it. That I, I'm dead serious. It is absolutely delightful, man. You right. just will smile watching that I'll show. It, I'll put it at the top of my list. Yeah, Darnell, is there anything you learned about yourself that you didn't already know during quarantine? No, I I I already knew I was a hermit. No, so, so this is- you know, the quarantine really didn't do too much to me because I'm out here at the house and I have like a half acre, so I'm always digging in the dirt. So my routine really didn't change. And I came out here before all of that, you know, people thought <laughs> it's like, uh, did you have something to do with this? How is it you uh, came out here to your house and all of this stuff? You're you're safe and sound, and all this stuff um, all of a sudden jumps off. I was like, hey, don't ask me. They got your but, numbers, Darnell. Huh? They got your <laughs> numbers, buddy. Yeah, right. So yeah, no, it hasn't really affected me, other than you know the you know the typical don't forget your mask and your gloves and all that kind of stuff. You know. Yeah. The adjustment. True. 
Darren, I'll oh, talk sure. about, um, is it is true that you were a dancer on Soul Train? Oh my God, yeah. Talk about that. That talk was that. amazing. I had so much fun. I would have been something like that. Being a, being a young guy first out in Hollywood, you know, um, I just, uh, I happened, let's see, how did I, how did I end up on that show? I knew this actress named Vanetta McGee, who was um, Max Julian's partner. I happened to be walking on Hollywood Boulevard and they were parked up there um, with the doors open, talking to this beautiful young lady of color. And she reminded me of my mom, you know, she had all this long, my mom didn't have red hair, but she, her hair was red. And um, she looked at me and she's like, oh my God, you look just like my son. I was like, what? <laughs> and she actually was um, the talent coordinator one of the talent coordinators for Soul Train. And um, she was like, if you would like to, you can go dance on the show. It's like, there's no pay. I was like, are you kidding? Soul Train was such a big thing before I left home, you know? Um, and now here I am about to dance on one of my favorite shows. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a lot of fun. And, and you released an, some R&B tracks. Oh God! No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could find them online. <laughs> that's not that's uh, not me. That's not me. That's not <laughs> Another <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. That is great. Um, and I so excited. I hope they get to pick up after you know, production starts again, but loved uh, the pilot for Melange. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm glad you liked it. Cause I, when yeah. I watched it, I was like, hmm, is this gonna work? Um, and you know, with the um, um, popularity of Shit's Creek, I was, after I watched it, I was like, wow, Melange. Totally. How, how timely, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we'll great. see, we'll see. You know, that would be nice oh. working back home again. Do you miss New York? Always, yeah. I mean, it's easy being here at the house, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I it's it's a little difficult because of my heart is in two places. I love this place, and I love my uh, I love New York too. You know, mm -hmm. Larry, what's next for you when this is uh, all over? Uh, we are putting together, a, a friend of mine and I, a, uh, a short film we're, we're going to uh, pull together. It's based on a script called The God Game that I did with uh, Yvonne Perry about five years ago. We were, we were, we're tightening up the script. We're paring it down. We're uh, focusing the energy. Uh, and we're going to make about a 25-minute short film out of it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What, what's the story? It's, it's a very political story. Which is very timely right, uh, right now. It has to do with a uh, uh, a husband who is a candidate who has uh, the potential to lose his wife. He lies about his belief in God, and then of course he has to lie about his belief in God in order to, to stay on the ticket and, and to win the election. But she goes, "You don't believe in God. You never believe." How can you pretend to believe in God? And she, she's a true believer. So it's it's a really it's an intense uh, story. So that sounds that's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. And the, the author is Suzanne Bradbury. She's written a number of really wonderful plays. And, and, and uh, Suzanne Bradbury. You know her? You know her? And she just sounded familiar there for a minute. Um, yeah. So the, so anyway, that's that's next on my list, and and I and I. I'm hoping that uh, there's this there's this uh, actress named um, uh, Tracy Oliver. She's a writer producer. Um, she's been very successful. She's got a series called Tracy Oliver Untitled, and I had just booked a guest star on that show, 
uh, and I'd actually uh, gone out to Greenpoint, Brooklyn to, to do my to get my costume fittings and all that stuff. And the next day they said, "This is back in March." <laughs> they said, um, "We're going to uh, postpone the, the shooting of this because of the pandemic for a couple of weeks. We'll give you a call when we're, when we're ready to uh, start up again." That was six months ago. Yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, they actually even sent me a paycheck. <laughs> Even though I haven't done the work, so I'm hoping that they revive it once this is over because I had this one of the scenes I had was with Whoopi Goldberg. And oh, wow, really fun to work with. I would imagine that they, um, they're going to go forward. I mean, I'm, I'm going to Atlanta to do, I mean, I guess, I guess they haven't canceled it yet. Um, mid mid November, uh, you know? what are you going to do? I'm sure that'll happen. I'm sure that'll happen. Yeah, um, National Geographic is um, doing this mini series entitled Genius, and each series, you know, is dedicated to a particular genius. The first one is Albert Einstein. Second one, I can't remember who it is. The third one, which I um, have a small part in, is um, Aretha Franklin. You know, oh, that's wow. what this is about. I'm playing Gordon Parks. Oh wow! Yeah, that's why I'm growing my hair and letting the gray mustache. Looking sharp. That's there. awesome. I have to. Where's I have to show you what I gotta look like? Hold on. Okay, uh, Larry. Somebody, uh, one of our fans, just asked, "Can you talk about working with Victoria Wyndham at Another World?" Oh, she was great. She was just a real powerhouse. Um, what was she like? She was. She was strong. She was uh, an awesome actor. Um, you, you, you didn't want to mess with her. You, know, you, did, you did not want to like, you know, be a, a sloppy actor around her because she was not kind to people. You did not take it seriously. Um, but if, as long as you were a, a, a committed actor, it was good. good uh, you know, that that sounds like Liz Hubbard at World Turns because you know she she wants to do yeah. the work. She wants yeah. to do the work. Very she wants a she wants a professional on the other side. <laughs> One thing that surprised me was that she was Actually, what I'm looking for. What was that? One of the, Sorry about that. Wait, wait, hold on, Darnell. Sorry. What was that, Larry? Is that one thing that surprised me about Victoria was that she was the a, a manager of a rock and roll band. A rock and roll band? Yeah, did you know that? No. Yeah. yeah. He managed the rock and roll band? Yeah. Never heard that. I mean, unless unless I totally hallucinated this, I'm pretty. Victoria sure. Wyndham was the man. Wow, I'm gonna have to look that up when we're done. <laughs> Please do. If I'm wrong, let me know. I will. <laughs> Garnell, did you find that picture? No, naturally, when I'm um, when I'm looking for it, I can't freaking find it. It's it's been over there for like three weeks, and now uh, it's not. Now now right. it's gone. Oh, I I love this. Uh, let, let's end on this question. I love it. The fan Terrell just wrote it. What does the legacy of all my children mean to you, to each of you, Darnell? The legacy, what does it mean? Um, I guess, what does it mean? The legacy? Well, I guess if first you have to describe the legacy. What is the legacy? <laughs> um, I guess the legacy would be family. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. and what does family mean to me? Everything. That's great. Uh, uh, Larry, and to you, but I'll tell you, Andrea just said, I named my son after Jamie Frame. Oh, well, <laughs> I think she's talking about when I played him because I heard there were eight Jamie's. Yeah, okay. yeah, it could be. But she did say she named him after you. Jamie, so she loved her another world. What does all my children mean to you? Yeah, just such wonderful, fond memories. Uh, it means to me, it has a lot to do with growth and kindness and, and uh, goodness. Um, the, um, this, uh, Darnell hit it, I think, as simply as it needs to be put in family. And you both were so young, so it must have been such a great just learning experience. Well, you know, in your 20s. Larry, you hit it on the head when you said growth. 
um, it was a, be a, a beginning. It was a, it, it was a night, it was a new beginning, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for being here. I know you made, you know, these guys watching today very, very happy. They, uh, they've been asking me, you know, if I could find you two and I'm, I'm thankful you both said yes. So well, thank, thank you. you. No, it's my pleasure. Really stay, appreciate it. Stay well. And uh, have a great day, everybody. You guys, too. Stay safe. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. Bye. See you.